So today is a perfect day to do some hand selections on my corn project. To understand what I'm doing, I have to explain a little bit about why corn is so unique amongst uh, domesticated species, especially domesticated grain. There's two things that make corn special and make the selection that you can do on corn much more powerful than the, the selection you can do on other grain species. Well, corn is unique amongst grain species in that the plant is what you would call in biology monaceous. That means the, the female flowers and the male flowers are on separate parts of the plant. And that enables you to isolate the pollination of the female flowers, from, which is a very powerful form of selection. You can individually select a corn plant just by looking at the ear, which you can't really do with any of the small grains. The other thing that makes corn unique pretty much amongst grain crops for sure is the principle of xenia. And xenia basically means that you can see genetic differences in the seed that are visibly apparent. So like when you look at a handful of barley kernels, you can't tell really anything about the genetic qualities of those seeds because what you're actually looking at is maternal tissue. There are protective maternal tissues that are covering those embryos and you can't really learn anything about the genetics of the embryo itself. With corn, corn is unique in that you can look through the maternal tissue and see what's going on in the embryo. And because the ear is such a large and visible structure, you get really a lot of information about both the individual kernel and about the mother plant itself, which enables you to select corn much more aggressively than you can select any other grain crop. Um, that's only true in certain instances though. And so let's talk about the structure of a corn kernel. Here is a diagram of a corn kernel from two different angles, from the side and from the front, cross section, okay? And so you have a couple of different important structures in a corn kernel. You have the pericarp or the hull or the seed coat, whatever you want to call it, but I call it the pericarp. Um, that's this external layer surrounding the entire kernel. That is maternal tissue. But the unique part about the pericarp on a corn plant is it is transparent in some cases. Below the pericarp is the first layer of embryonic tissue which is called the allurone. Allurone is a single layer of cells except in very specific and special cases and allurone is very high in protein. They're very large cells and they serve some functions in uh, germination signaling and they also have uh, very high uh, nutritional content especially in terms of protein. Um, allurone is also where there can be some pigment. Blue corn and green corn uh, some of like a lot of your colored decorative corns which which have like multiple different colors on a single ear that is all going to be allurone color um, allurone pigment so all of those pigments like in a blue corn all of the blue pigment is located right here in the single single layer of cells in the allurone okay and so if you have colored allurone you will not be able to see through that allurone to the endosperm and so you won't be able to tell anything about the genetics of the endosperm uh, if you have pigmented allurone. That's the reason why all of both of my corn projects I don't have colored pericarp and I don't have colored allurone because I'm interested in knowing what's going on in the endosperm and I can't do that if I can't see it. Here, when the pericarp genetics are clear, they are transparent, you can see through the pericarp to the surface of the, the, um, the seed, to the actual embryonic tissue. 
Now seeds have two, corn kernels and all angiosperm seeds have two separate structures inside them. They have the endosperm and the germ or the embryo. And those are actually two separate organisms. The endosperm is sacrificial. It just serves to feed the germ, the embryo, and it is used up in the germination process but it is actually a separate, genetically separate organism, but it is closely genetically related to the embryo. Um, so how that helps us with corn is that because you can see through the pericarp, through the maternal tissue, and actually visibly look at the genetics of the embryo. Now, that's complicated by the fact that what you actually are looking at is the endosperm and not the actual germ. When you look at the germ, pretty much the germ of any corn plant is going to look exactly like any other corn plant and you can't actually look at the germ which is actually going to be the plant someday and learn anything. But you can look at the endosperm and learn a whole awful lot about the genetics of the germ just by uh, the process of elimination. But it is complicated by the fact that you know, your embryo is diploid tissue. It has one copy of its genes from the mother plant and one copy of its genes from the father plant. Endosperm, at least in corn, is triploid. So it has two copies of its genes from the mother plant and one copy of its genes from the father plant. And that's actually really helpful. It's a little, it makes things a little more complicated, but it also makes things really helpful because you can learn a whole lot about the genetics of your mother plant and about your father plant by what happens in this endosperm, but only for a few specific characteristics. And as it pertains to my corn breeding, um, ex corn breeding projects, I have selected a bunch of traits that I am very interested in, which can be visually selected for by looking at the corn kernel itself. So I'm gonna focus quickly on how I'm actually doing these selections. So what I have is I have a bright sunny day and the sun shining off the snow and I can see through that pericarp into the individual corn kernels, right? And I can say, these three kernels are very dark orange. I wanna put those and keep those separate and put them in the nursery row. So what I can do is I can pop them off with my little screwdriver here and give them a place to grow and I can just go through and select my darkest kernels and then I will bag those individually and then I will be able to grow out these dark orange kernels in a nursery row and all of these will be selfed. All of these are going to get selfed in a nursery row and then in 2018 the best plants from the nursery row with the best looking ears that have been selfed will be grown out as a special pollinator row in my 2018 flint corn project while and then I will also be growing out a nursery row of 2017 selected ears for the 2019 father plant uh, pollination rows so that tell that gives me the ability to very intensely and heavily select the best uh, darkest orange kernel genetics and in the nursery row I'm also going to be selecting for agronomic characteristics like uh, stalk strength and disease resistance and yield as best as I can to pick the best plants that I can to be the parents to be the fathers of the further generations so that I am pushing my corn breeding project towards higher carotene genetics towards higher uh, productivity towards higher disease resistance and towards better adaptation to the 
very specific soil and climate characteristics here in this little valley okay and so I am tuning this corn to be really perfect to grow right here on Oxbow Farm. If I'm just choosing the flintiest, darkest orange kernels, that is going to skew my population very rapidly towards a very hard flint, dark orange corn population. And the opposite is true with my flower corn. Um, here is an ear of my flower corn. This is a Tushpeño de derived plant, and you can actually see right there that very light yellow kernel. I'm going to just pop that one out because I do not want yellow kernels in my flower corn population. That one can get fed to the chickens. And that is almost certainly a cross contamination from my flint. You know, I, I grow them widely separated, but they're not so widely separated. And I'm also trying to get them widely separated in pollination time, but there's still some overlap. And so I get a little bit of yellow endosperm in my uh, flower corn population so I just but it because of the principles of xenia I know that my flower corn in general is heterozygous for white endosperm so if I see a yellow endosperm kernel I know that it's a cross and so if you're growing open pollinated corn in an, in an area where you've got a lot of like commercial corn being grown commercial genetically modified or you know just regular commercial corn belt dent is pretty much invariably yellow endosperm so I would highly recommend you choose a white corn to grow because then you can see anytime you've got some cross pollination you will see it in the kernels you will see those yellow kernels showing up and you can pick those out and it won't be a lot unless you're planting it right up against another cornfield Corn pollen does fly through the air, but it is not viable for very long periods, and it is rather heavy. So the further your cornfield is away from commercial cornfields, the less likely you are to get heavily, you know, any genetically modified pollen is largely going to get swamped out by the, you know, by the pollen coming from your own planting and any tiny amounts of cross-pollination you will be able to see and just pick out. It will be visible on the ear as a yellow kernel. So you can just come through with you know a screwdriver or a little bit of like an ice pick or something and just pop those kernels off and save the rest of that ear for seed. It doesn't contaminate any of the other kernels. Any of the cross-pollinated kernels you'll be able to see on a white corn. If you're growing an open pollinated yellow corn, you won't be able to tell because you're, you'd be pollinating a yellow corn with a yellow corn, okay?